Good morning. Let's just check how many people in the room have pools at their house. How many of you are inviting the rest of us over to your house <laughs> after today? A little bit warm today. Yeah, I'm thrilled that you're here. Uh, we're in a series about going deeper because I think most people know that a shallow life is a hollow life. And uh, it always feels a little safer in the shallows, but we want to go deeper in our faith and in our experience of and expression of God. Today we're going to talk about something that is a little bit challenging. How do you share your faith with others? How do you talk to God about others without coming off like a jerk? <laughs> yeah. And in case you're interested about that, that's what we're going to talk about. And some of you right now are, are jotting down the names of others that you want to send this message to. And, uh, I'd like to look in Acts, the first chapter, and uh, I always encourage you, of course we have scripture on screen, but if you have it on a smart device or you brought a Bible with you, always great to look for yourself. And in fact, if you don't remember, we actually have a lot of Bibles in the back of the room that are available to you when you come in. In Acts chapter three, or Acts chapter one, verse three, it says, after his suffering, Jesus presented himself to his disciples and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We are all natural evangelists until it comes to our faith. We like to share the things we like. If you go to a really nice restaurant, you will tell other people about it. If you have a really good meal, you will tell other people about it. If you listen to some really good music, you will share it with someone else. If, if you have a hobby that you've started, you'll talk to other people about it. If you've developed a new habit or broken an old one, it's perfectly natural to share that with other people. A movie that you liked, a TV series that you're watching, something you're binge watching, we automatically share it with others. And to be fair, we also share the things that we don't like. But the point is, is that when it comes to our faith, we don't share like that. In fact, most recent poll shows that 52% of Americans who identify as Christian consider it to be disrespectful to talk to someone else about Jesus with the intention of changing their views about God, that you're disrespecting the other person. That's 52% of Christians. 66% of Americans who identify themselves as Christians say they have no strategy. They've never learned a way to share their faith. And 70% of people who consider themselves Christians in the United States have not had a single conversation about faith with a person who's not already a believer in the last six months. 70%, not one conversation. So what is different about our faith from all the other things that we enjoy? Um, I'm going to do something I've never seen another pastor do. I've never heard another pastor do this. I could lose my job for this. <laughs> but I'm going to give you some good reasons for keeping your faith private. You ready? We don't want to offend people. We don't want to share our faith in an inadequate way so that people misunderstand the gospel. We don't want to say something wrong so that people will reject the gospel. We don't want to be labeled by others as less intelligent just because we believe in something other than materialism. 
We don't want to be associated with someone who poorly represented Jesus. We don't want to seem overbearing and obnoxious. We don't think that our personality is good at these kinds of conversations. We don't feel that we know enough about the Bible to be able to respond to a question someone might have. We don't want to be rejected by people that we care about. And we don't want to make others feel awkward. And to be honest, those are all reasonable reasons. But we have to contend with the command that Jesus gave us. So how are we supposed to reconcile this tension when everything inside of me would prefer to keep this private and the person who has changed our life wants us to share that with someone else? It's a real internal tension and it's why so few people share their faith. By the way, I should, I should probably clarify something. Sharing our opinions about the world is not the same thing as sharing our faith. Sharing our politics is not sharing our faith. If you brought up a political party or a political personality in your conversation, you're not sharing Jesus, you're using Jesus to share your political views. Not the same thing at all. Why is it so hard to share our faith? And why do so few people actually do it? Because Jesus told his earliest followers that they had a mission. They're a missional community. This is what I want you to do. I want you to share good news with everyone. It's that simple, sharing good news with everyone. And Jesus went on to tell his followers that this is something they would not and could not do on their own. You see, even Jesus knew it was easier to talk about a good meal or a good song than it is to talk about a good God. And that's why he says, you are going to have to wait until you are empowered because as good as this news is, you will always have rational reasons to keep it to yourself. So you have to wait. Now, a lot of people, when they think about the Holy Spirit, they think the Holy Spirit is the source of an experience. But what we learn on the day of Pentecost is that what the Holy Spirit does is he actually helps us to share the experience we've already had, not to try to get the experience we've always wanted. And maybe if you would like a greater experience in God, it might be worth sharing what he's already done in your life because what is the interest of the Holy Spirit giving you something you will not share with someone else? So, uh, I think that sometimes when we try to talk about our faith, we come across as knowing more than we actually know or being right about a lot of things. And I think that it actually helps to approach our faith conversations with a little bit of humility. In fact, I think humility makes sharing our faith an act of generosity. Uh, for example, uh, if you wanted to talk to someone else about some good things that have happened in your life, you might want to share it like this. You could say, uh, I would really like to think that I'm personally responsible for all the good things that's happened in my life. And to be honest, my pride is larger than my capacity to be grateful, but what I've come to realize is, is I'm not responsible for every good thing that's happened in my life, and I've got to give some credit to God. Or maybe it's something like this. I would like to think that I am tough enough and strong enough person to be able to endure really hard and difficult times, that I would have the capacity to bounce back from devastating experiences. But the truth about me is, is that the strength of my will isn't quite enough to do that. And what I've come to realize is my capacity to keep moving forward in life is because I have discovered I am not alone in life, that God is with me and he actually cares for me. Instead of looking down on people because they're going through a hard time, acknowledging that the only reason we're able to get through those things is because we've discovered how loving, how caring, and how great God really is. 
See, our goal is not to prove we are right. Our goal is to prove God is good. We should think about that. We argue too much trying to prove we are right. And it does not promote the gospel. But God is good. So he says, I want you to be a witness. So what is a witness? Well, there's two nuances to this. And the first is a witness to someone who shares what they've seen and they've heard. You might be, have been called to be a witness in a court trial. Um, I've actually had that happen a couple of times in my life, and I've been in courts where I've seen other witnesses called, and uh, I've also seen a number of television shows about courtroom dramas, and so I know that when a person sits on a witness stand, they have to make a promise, an oath, that they are going to only tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help them God. And then they'll sit down, and a series of questions will come both from the person who's prosecuting the offender and also a person who's defending the potential offender. And, and this is what I know. The witness can speak and can describe and can explain what they actually saw or what they actually heard. But if they try to talk about anything else, there will always be an objection from one of the attorneys because that's called hearsay. They only want to hear what's actually happened to that person. I think sometimes when we want to share our faith, we think that what we have to do is to share maybe lots of doctrines from the Bible or lots of distinctives of our church or the differences of our denominations or the history of God's people throughout creation. If you want to be a witness, the most important thing you can share is what God has actually done in your life. That's a very powerful story. And maybe they want to argue a particular point. I have lots of people who have tried to argue religious concepts with me, and, and, and they're opposed to the whole idea of religion. And what I can tell you is I've been doing this most of my life, and I have done an intense amount of study, and I still don't have an answer to every single objection. God does, but I'm not God. And uh, sometimes... We just have to not get caught up in the argument. In fact, there's a great story in the New Testament. Jesus had healed a person who was blind from birth. And the problem with this healing is that he did it on the Sabbath, which really ticked off the religious people because they considered that to be a form of work and working on the Sabbath was breaking the law and that meant Jesus was a sinner. And so this person was healed on the Sabbath and everybody's talking about it and the person is very happy about it. And twice they interrogated him and they also interrogated his parents and they said, is it true that this person did an act of work on the Sabbath. And, and he said, well, yes, he healed me. And he said, so that makes him a sinner. And finally, this is what he says. Whether this man is a sinner or not, I cannot tell you. What I can tell you is that I was blind, but now I see. <laughs> what do you do with that? Like you can have lots of arguments, but if your story is, I was blind and now I see, and I don't have a complete explanation for that. And I don't think you do either. That's a very powerful story. We should think about that a little bit. So a witness is someone who can, can talk about what they've seen and they've heard. And now this other thing, this is going to be a little bit harder to describe because the word witness literally in scripture, in the original language, is the word martyr. <laughs> I can see how happy you were about that. Just now let's reread that phrase or rethink re about what Jesus said. Don't go anywhere. Wait in Jerusalem until you receive the promise of my father, which I told you about. And when you receive the Holy Spirit, you will be endued with power to be my martyrs in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the world. You get to go and die everywhere. Now do you see why it's hard to share your faith? Because that's a thing. That's a real thing. A martyr just simply means it's not a person who died by disease. It's not a person who died by accident. It's not a person who died by suicide. 
A martyr is someone who there's something they believed in or someone they believed in, and they will not recant that belief, even if it costs them their life. In fact, you can't stop them from acknowledging it. And so Jesus says that I want you to be my martyrs. When you look at Jesus, Jesus spoke the truth and, and he helped people who were suffering. And he stood up to religious bullies and he knew what the cost was going to be, but he was willing to lay his life down. Here's the thought I want you to think about a little bit this morning is that when you tell someone else and speak the truth about Jesus, it will often feel like a little death inside of you. What is going on? Because you understand that by having this conversation, someone's respect for you could die. A relationship could die. An opportunity that is on the table right now might die if you actually acknowledge something about your relationship with God. You have an experience of God's grace, God's love, God's power, God's peace, God's comfort. You have stories like that. I've heard lots of them. These are stories that are worth remembering. And when you do, you'll always have something to share, but you'll always have something to thank God for too. It will feel like a little death when you tell somebody else. Now the good news is, is that we're not disposable in God's kingdom. We're actually rechargeable. We're refillable. The Holy Spirit wants us, wants to help us share our faith and he's come to empower us for that purpose. But I wish I could tell you that that was a, a one-off, that a, if that happened to you one time, then you will always have all the resource you need to handle any situation you walk into and you will always have the words you need to speak in any conversation you will ever be in. But that's actually not how it works. The Holy, all of the works of the Holy Spirit are renewable when you think about it, right? The very first work of the Holy Spirit in our life is to draw our heart to Jesus. Even before we know Jesus, even before someone has shared something about Jesus, he begins to do a work in our heart. And how many are glad that once you've come to know Jesus, he doesn't stop drawing you to Jesus. Like that's a good thing, right? He keeps drawing us. And then he gives us the assurance of our faith, our salvation. I wish I could tell you that if you ever had a moment of assurance, you will never have another doubt. <laughs> but that's actually not true. And the good news is, is that the work of the Holy Spirit is renewable. He will continue to draw you to Jesus and he will continue to give you the assurance of your salvation. And there is another work of the Holy Spirit and that is he wants to empower us to be witnesses for Jesus. And it's not a one-time experience. It's a renewable experience. We're rechargeable beings. In fact, in Acts, the fourth chapter tells a great story. Peter and John had been arrested. They had been charged. They had been imprisoned and they had been beaten and then they had been intimidated and warned. Don't talk anymore about Jesus. This is the story of what happens to them when they come back to the other believers in Jerusalem. In Acts 4 it says on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they raised their voices. No kidding. That's a common thing that people do. But how they raised their voices is what's uncommon. They raised their voices together in prayer to God. And now we get to hear what they said to God. Sovereign Lord, 
You made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. And then they quote from one of the Psalms. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against the anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed and they did what your power and your will had decided beforehand should happen now Lord now they're going to ask for something what are they going to ask for now Lord consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus and after they had prayed the place that they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God boldly. <laughs> that is so encouraging. They were filled with the Holy Spirit in chapter 2, but they're being refilled with the Holy Spirit in chapter 4. The fullness of the Spirit is freshly available to any of us in any situation. They had been threatened. They didn't respond in anger. They responded in prayer. And they asked the Holy Spirit to actually increase their confidence to speak comfortably to other people about the good things of God. And they asked the Holy Spirit to actually bring healing. He didn't pray. Hurt them back for hurting us. Let us be instruments of healing as we go. And the place that they were meeting was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's when they began again to speak the word of God with boldness. We will not be effective witnesses without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We're not going to argue people into the kingdom of God. Blasting people with biblical truth isn't going to have the effect that you might desire. So what does the Holy Spirit want to help us do? And this is surprising. The first thing will surprise you. The Holy Spirit wants to help us listen. What are we hearing? And quite honestly, a lot of the things that we're hearing are driving a lot of our emotions and our decisions. And I don't think that's working very well. We need to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say. We need to listen. The people that we're talking to have a stumbling block. There's something that stands between them and the grace of God. And often we have no idea what it is. Maybe they were hurt by another religious person. Maybe they've been exposed to inconsistency in a person's life who claims to have connected with Jesus, but their life is actually filled full of all kinds of problems and inconsistencies. Maybe they've been taught that faith is just a relic for people who lived in, in previous times before science and education. And, and they, that's their explanation for how the world works. But now we know how the world really works. We don't know what their concerns are. And we can listen to what they're saying. But we also need to listen to what the Holy Spirit suggests to us as a response. What personal experience with Christ have you had? that you could talk about and say, well, pastor, actually, they're talking about something I've never experienced. That doesn't mean you have nothing to say. You could actually say something like this. I, I actually don't have any personal experience in something like that. I've, I've been through some challenges, but not that. And I'm sorry that you're going through that. And I would like to encourage you I've been through some things too, and what I did is I just reached out to God. And I'm wondering if you did that, if it might help. And you might even offer to pray for them. And by the way, when you do this, the goal is, is not to trap them. Has anybody here ever been held hostage by a long prayer? I have. <laughs> I've got stories about that, but not enough time to tell them. <laughs> A simple prayer. Heavenly Father, 
my friend is struggling with, and you just briefly describe it, would you please help them and show them how much you care for them? And I'm asking you to do that in the name of your son who proved his and your love for all of us. Amen. And you'd be surprised how powerful a prayer like that can be. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come out. That the Holy Spirit can help us listen, but he also helps us speak. He can give us words, ideas, bring something to our memory that's helpful in this conversation right now. And why does he do that? Because he wants our friends, please hear this, he wants our friends to understand something about God that they don't understand yet. When you think about it, the initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit was exactly this. People from nations all over the world had gathered for a very important festival. It was called the Feast of Pentecost, and it was the celebration of first harvest. And there were people who spoke lots of different languages, and, and none of them were to be left out. And God enabled his followers to declare the wonderful things of God in the languages that they spoke. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that spiritual language or speaking in tongues is only for the purpose of sharing with someone whose language we don't know, but I think there's a, there's a principle we can draw from this. The Holy Spirit wants to empower you to speak in a way other people understand. Now, I know there might be someone who will tell you, well, you just, you just need to say what you need to say the way you want to say it and not care what they think. I'm, I'm pretty convinced that not caring is not a good strategy for reaching a lost and a dying world. God cared deeply. Jesus cares deeply. The Holy Spirit cares deeply. And we can too. And it can start with something as simple as maybe a way to think about how we're starting a day. As you're drinking your coffee or standing in the shower or driving in the car on the way to work, you could whisper a prayer towards heaven that just says, please, God, would you freshly empower me with your spirit today? Would you present an opportunity where I might get to share something good you've done in my life with someone who might really need to hear it? And you would be surprised how often God answers that prayer. Let's bow our heads. Father, we are grateful. Your grace is overwhelming to us. Your mercy, we don't have a way to measure it out. And the difference you've made in our life is so remarkable. And we don't want to keep this to ourselves. Every person in our world has a human right to know about you. We think you've actually strategically placed us in our families, our neighborhoods, our workplaces, and in conversations so that we could be a conduit of your grace to share something of your goodness with someone else. Would you please help us be open to that on this day and all that follow. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.